Susan Graham was born in Roswell, New Mexico and raised in Midland, Texas. Uh, she graduated from Texas Tech University and she attended the Manhattan School of Music. Susan made her international debut at Covent Garden uh, in Massenet's Cherubin and uh, she's performed in every major opera house in the world since then. Uh, the Met, Salzburg, Chicago Lyric, San Francisco, the Paris Opera, uh, you name it, and Susan's been there. Susan also uh, premiered several new operas, including John Harbison's The Great Gatsby at the Met, where she played Jordan Baker. Uh, Jake Heggie wrote Dead Man Walking for Susan. She pre premiered the role of Sister Helen Prejean. And uh, in Tobias Pickers, An American Tragedy, where she played the role of Sandra Finchley. Uh, the, uh, her, Susan's mastery of the French song repertoire and songs by contemporary American composers is unparalleled. Um, we'll hear a little bit of that tonight. Um, Susan made her Carnegie Hall recital debut in 2003, which I, and I was there, I remember it, and I, I will never forget it. It was, it was transporting. Um, Susan Graham sang Bless This House at George W. Bush's second inauguration in 2005, and she sang Schubert's Ave Maria at the nationally televised funeral mass for Ed, uh, Senator Kennedy in 2009, and she's a U.S. delegate for UNESCO. Susan Graham is one of the three greatest mezzo-sopranos in the world, and uh, her velvety voice, as you'll hear tonight, if you haven't heard it before, will transport you to other worlds and reaches deep into our hearts. Please welcome my friend, Susan Graham. Hi, everybody. Tobias, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. I feel like I have a lot to live up to now. <laughs> you, you've already lived up to it. Oh, uh, sweet. So tell, uh, tell us a little bit about, you, you were born in near Area 51 and then- Darling, I have to say Area 51 is in Nevada. Everyone always thinks, but there were apparently two places where the aliens landed. One was Roswell and the other was Nevada. But yeah, <laughs> I always say that uh, most people, when they find out I'm from Roswell, New Mexico says, oh, that explains a lot. <laughs> but um, yeah. There's, I, no, there's no Area 51 in Roswell. No, that's in Nevada. Oh, it's a highly sorry. classified okay. area of Nevada. But you know, we have our own aliens. And mm -hmm. you know, I think I think my family, some of my family, are among them. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, as far as you being grew up in Texas, right? You moved to Texas and grew up I, in middle. Yeah, Texas. when I was in uh, eighth grade, yeah, we moved to Texas, and um, and I completed high school there, and then I went to college at Texas Tech, as you said, for seven years, and uh, I got a bachelor's and a master's degree, and a lot of life experience. <laughs> which is why it took me seven years to get two degrees. And mm -hmm. then I moved to New York to go to Manhattan School of Music. And, and that's with, where it all really started to take off. Started with Cynthia Hoffman. I did. I did. And uh, I was in uh, the Manhattan School of Music production of a French Massenet opera called Cherubin, which is all about Cherubino. He gets his own opera in the French canon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, it was, I was, uh, it was life changing for me. It really was because at Manhattan School of Music, you know, all the New York agents came and all the, you know, because they, they suss out what's going on at Juilliard and Manhattan School and all those big conservatories. And um, so I, I, it's what sort of got the attention of, and of the New York press as well. And yeah. uh, I was getting my second master's degree, that was in 1985. And then I went to uh, Marilla that summer and uh, the San Francisco Opera Apprentice Program. And that also was life-changing. I mean, I just had all of these amazing things that happened in a sort of consecutive way. Um, Marilla is one of the top summer apprentice programs for young singers in the country. And, um, and I did okay in that. And I uh, went back to New York to start the first school year in 
something like 26 years not starting school. I had been in school for a very long time at that point. And, um, and then I started auditioning. I had a manager. I started auditioning, doing competitions. And one thing led to another. And here we are talking to Tobias Picker. And did you know that I studied the voice with Cynthia Hoffman as well? I did not know that. I didn't know that you did until I was reading your biography. She's such yes, a nice lady. Yeah, I was 18. And she, uh, she taught me that I had a falsetto, which I did not know. You could have been a famous countertenor. Well... Well, everyone has a falsetto, don't they? Yeah, but if you were actually, you know, using it. No, it was just the get it, reaching the top and learning about my passaggio and all of that. So, yeah, I'd forgotten I did that, but I did. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. So you went on, and then you went to um, Covent Garden was, was later, right? It was later, yeah. Covent Garden was after my Met debut. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Um, you know, I, I, I did uh, Seattle Opera, San Diego Opera, um, Michigan Opera Theater. All the young artist programs. The, no, all... no, no young artist programs. No, no never a full-time young artist program. Uh -huh. Yeah, I got hired to do roles in these places, um, sort of after my first year. Opera Theater St. Louis was a huge uh, catalyst because I was one year out of school and I got to sing Erica in Samuel Barber's Vanessa at sort of 27 years old. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven. And it was such a great production and the colleagues, it was Richard Stilwell and Elaine Bonazzi and John David DeHaan. It was all these people. I thought I had, I just thought I was in the presence of greatness, which I was very fortunate to be. And it was one of those, after after opening night, um, my future manager came up to me and said, wow, it's a real shame that this happened so early in your career because it's going to be downhill from here. <laughs> Just wrong, the level of work and the level of theater that, that we were able to accomplish. I will say that there were there were many, uh, many events that equaled that in my estimation. So it wasn't downhill. So and so you after you premiered The Great Gatsby and was it ninety nine I think at the Met okay um, you did right after that you did the world premiere of Dead Man Walking by Jake Kagi that's right that was in two thousand and that was written for you and it also um, uh, was the the the, mo the movie was starred another Susan Susan Sarandon. That's right. We have a picture of you with Susan Sarandon uh, and some other production shots. Those are production shots we have. That's from the world premiere performance. This is from the world premiere. This one is with Flicka. I was Flicka. Sister Helen. Uh, this is Sarah. Right. And that's also from the premiere. Yeah. Oh, there we are. Oh, that's a great picture. That was in my dressing room on opening night with Julie Andrews, Susan Sarandon, Sister Helen Fréjean, and me, and, and a whole bunch of flowers on top of my piano. And um, I will say that Susan Sarandon, Sarandon she, did, she was not fond of me. Why is that? What, what, what was well, the problem? She had won an Academy Award for playing Sister Helen, and she was a little territorial about that, that uh, character. And she, you know, I don't blame her, but she came to the opera and that was very nice. Now, Julie Andrews, on the other hand, she came backstage and I was gobsmacked because Julie Andrews was my first female vocal hero from the time I was a child. You know, Mary Poppins and The Sound of Music and all that. And so Julie Andrews was standing backstage and, and I had just come off stage and she was standing in front of my dressing room door and she shook my hand and she said, oh my dear, however do you float those beautiful high Gs? Mm -hmm. And I said, I, coming from you, that's the greatest compliment ever. And I said, you were the first nun I ever played. And she said, what do you mean? I said, in high school, I was, I was um, Maria in The Sound of Music. <laughs> so I have a history of playing nuns. Did, 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 Sister Helen did and didn't come back to congratulate you too? She did, but she was a little frosty. Uh, uh -huh. And John Penn was there. 
also who who was the convict in the movie and tim robbins was there and uh, uh, uh woody harrelson was there uh, and it was and gary marshall was there because gary marshall and Julie Andrews were, I think, making The Princess Diaries in San Francisco at that time. And so all over California, you know, we, were, we did this at the San Francisco Opera. So everybody came from wherever to be a part of this um, Hollywood meets opera moment. Well, at a, a, year, a few years later in 2005, um, I wrote the role of Sandra Finchley for you in An American Tragedy, which was premiered at the Met. And... Um, we didn't have as many movie stars backstage, but I do remember coming backstage after one of the performances and Shirley MacLaine was in your dressing room and I met her and uh, asked her if she'd ever read the novel by Theodore Dreiser. And she said, yes, when I was six. So I don't think there are any other movie stars there, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg was there. Yeah, she was at everything. I mean, Ruth Bader Ginsburg loved Francesca so much, and and you too probably. And she she didn't she didn't miss many of those kinds of events. So you you um uh you recall there was a film called A Place in the Sun that was based on an American tragedy that was made by George Stevens in 1951 uh -huh. and starred Elizabeth Taylor when she was 17 and Montgomery Cliff. That's right, that's there's, there's Nathan kissing. and me. There's Nathan and me kissing. That's Nathan and you, yes. Oh, I, 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 I fell woefully short of uh, Elizabeth Taylor's glamor, but I, I did my best. Oh, I, I think you, you pulled it off well. And we have a few production shots from that show too. That's just going to a coaching. That you and me? That's you and me in the bowels of the Met going to a coaching or coming oh from. Oh my home. gosh. Oh, I had short brown hair then. How about that? There you are with Nathan Gunn. Oh, yes. In your bathing outfit. Yes. Oh, and that's, that's I remember that moment exactly because I thought my face is turning away from him and it has to show that I've already hatched my plan. It shows it, yes. And here I dragged him to church. You dragged him to church and poor Patricia was set. <laughs> specter of no Patricia pregnant. over us. That was it. <laughs> There's Bill Burden and... Um, and Kim Begley and Jenny Larmore. Yeah. I tell you, man, that was an all superstar cast. It certainly was. There, there you are in, uh, in the... Uh, Final scene when Clyde's about to go to the electric chair. <gasps> oh dear! Two operas in a row with um, a electric theme, chairs. Theme oh. pairing. I remember that. I remember. Oh look, there we are. That was at the Opera News Awards, I think. Yes, it was. I think, and you got an award. I think that I year. I the first ever Opera News Award. That was the year, I think. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we're so cute. We were. We were. So do you, do you have do you have any other memories of of uh, American tragedy behind the oh scenes? My gosh. I just I remember I remember every day feeling the the joy of creating a character that nobody else had ever done on the opera stage, and with you in there and Francesca directing it, and two of my dearest friends, Patricia Rossette and Nathan Gunn and Bill Burden, and Kim Begley, and Jen Elmer, every, and Jenny Larmor. It was like, we were all in this wonderful sort of family feeling of trying to tell. And Delora Zadra, Delora. And Delora, yeah. yes. And, and, and we all just wanted to tell this, this American classic story. And the interesting thing that I was thinking about it today, they are accessible American, almost contemporary characters. But you, we, uh, in my character particularly, I had to, I had to keep that sort of uh, air of American aristocracy because she was a she was a snotty rich spoiled rich girl, mm -hmm. fell for this guy from the wrong side of the tracks, and and but she couldn't help herself, and I mean with Nathan Gunn, who could? Nobody no, can help. No. Us. 
And I remember my favorite. This man of the year. Exactly. My favorite scene, though, was the one where the set was like a dollhouse, kind of a cutaway dollhouse in some time in some scenes. And Pat was down on the on the stage level and Nathan and I were one level up and we were doing a duet and Pat was by herself. And but it was a trio and everybody was singing in real time things that they were really uh, involved in and experiencing but we were in separate parts of the stage. It was like a, it was like a split screen. It was like this in a movie, if, it, if we had a, a, a film sort of parallel. But I, that was my favorite scene. Of course, and the love scenes with Nathan. We, ha we, <laughs> we have a clip of you and a little bit of Nathan um, from an excerpt from the diving area. Okay. You were, I guess, falling for him and uh, he was falling, He'd fallen for you long before, and uh, you were inviting him to the country. Tobias, that was difficult. I know, and we, I, I sliced out the middle of it because it was it's long and hard. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's so cool. It's so cool. You did, did you see? You did you, I'm, I'm sure that everybody could see when I finally sat down there. Supposed to be so calm and reposed. I was going. <sighs> I didn't see that. No, I didn't. You look no. totally, totally cool. It was so much fun. It was so fun. So um, we're going to fast forward a little bit to 
your appearance at Tulsa Opera, which was in 2018. Oh, that was fun. And you came to us to perform in our gala, Stars of Line, um, and uh, with Sarah Coburn, uh, um, Aaron Blake, David Portillo, Tim Long conducted. You played and you accompanied yourself in La, La, Vie, en Ro La Vie en Rose. That's right. And uh, smoking a cigarette on stage, I think. Oh dear, it was, it was really a, a glorious time for Tulsa. But there you are, with your cigarette. Look at those pink chandeliers, they match my dress. Beautiful. Oh, I remember Beautiful. I took my, my shawl and I went flunk and flung it on the floor. Oh, I yeah, love that picture. That. Sarah Coburn. She's so great. And you, you did, um, you did lock me the flower duet with Sarah. That's right. That was that duet picture that I just that you just showed. And we, we don't we didn't we don't have that recording, but we do have a recording a video of you are performing it with Renee Fleming at the Richard Tucker Gala in yeah. 2015. I you remember? You might see the same pink dress. Uh, maybe, we'll see. Do you remember that gala? Yeah, yeah, I do.
tell you. So beautiful. I, I was just going to say, it's so funny to, to, to watch a, you know, Renee and I have sung together since we both won the Met competition in 1988 together the same year. And ever since then, we were just cast uh, next to each other in so many operas and so many things that we've done together. Um, it's funny how in, instinctively we phrase. I mean, I don't know if you noticed it in that, but mm -hmm. even that ensemble, nobody gave us that bleu at the very end, the very last note, but did it not? It, it just, plus, I'm just enough taller than she is that just I can peripherally see what when her mouth is about to close for the thing. So I just time mine to do it at the same time. <laughs> but, but really, we, we're so in tune with each other's voices. I mean, I can't tell you the number at least two or three times. And one of them was the Lock May duet that she was recording on, a, on an album. And I had to. I mean, I, I was the duet partner, but I would have to go in a couple months later and record it just with a track of her singing. I had to do that with a Hansel and Gretel evening prayer one time. And I had to match her German and I had to match her pitch and I had to match her timing and I had to match her phrasing just by listening to it in my ears because there was nobody else there except the recording engineers. And it was, but fortunately I have this, you know, this experience these years of experience of singing next to her so i can kind of get myself in the vibe it's funny recording is such a funny business you did rosen cavalier with her we have the trio from the uh the, the final trio from rosen cavalier with you and and uh, renee and christine schaefer yeah we, the did Met we, probably, we did it all over the world we did it in in um san francisco and the Met many, many, many times, Covent Garden, Paris. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some other places, but we've done that, that opera together all over the world many, 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 many times. And it's always a joy. We're, get, we're gonna see the final trio, it's four minutes or so. I'm the one in the middle.
got no words. Yeah, there are no words. Strauss, you, Renee, Christine, what else, what else could anyone want? That is the most exultant music I think ever written. It's, it's, it's invigorating to sing and it all just weaves together in that way that leads to that one big moment. It's just breathtaking, breathtaking. And such a privilege. It almost, make, it almost makes me cry to think about how lucky I was to sing that so many times. Well, it, it makes it makes everyone cry to to <laughs> hear this music and hear you interpret it. So Strauss would have been very proud. Thank I know. You. Thank you for playing that. It, it brings back a lot, a lot. It brings back a lot. We, let's let's move on to your recording career. Um, Sixteen solo recordings, at least, and a Grammy for your Ive songs in two thousand four. Um, you did the songs of Ned Roram in two thousand. Um, you worked with Ned on, on those, did he? And he was there. No, Ned is, no, I what? did not work with Ned on those. He uh, he sort of didn't want to be in on that because I called him, I knew him because I used to sing when I was in school, I used to sing at the church on Sundays. My singing job was singing at the church that his partner, Jim Holmes was the music director. Do you remember Jim? I, I knew Jim. Yeah. yeah. I, I just wanted for, for our, um, our uh, friends here. I wanted to just mention that Ned Roram is, um, the old, he's an American composer and he's the oldest living composer in the world right now, I believe, almost a hundred. So um, yeah, Ned, Ned was a very important part of my life and yours. We have a, a recording of early in the morning. He, he's lived in Paris for many years and this, is, this song I think meant a great deal to him. Isn't that a beautifully evocative song of just a morning? Song. I'm glad. I'm glad Ned had to follow Strauss and not me. <laughs> you know the funny <laughs> thing is, I, I learned that song as a freshman in college in Lubbock, Texas. So I love. I always think it's funny when I get to the line. I was 20 and a lover and in paradise to stay because when I learned it, I was 18 years old in Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but we, 
you want to talk a little about Poulenc? We have we have one one of your Poulenc recordings, Les oh. Chemin de well, L'Amour. I I I love Poulenc. I was reluctant to love Poulenc because it's very difficult. But my recital partner, Malcolm Martineau, who sort of has been my recital partner for 25 years, he is, he's brilliant and he has an encyclopedic knowledge of the repertoire. I call him um, Malcopedia, <laughs> Malcolm Martineau. Um, and he early on said to me, you know, your voice is really well suited for Poulenc because you know, it's clean and you, you know, you have good pitch and you have good French. And so all those things go together from the lyric songs to the really fast sparkly songs that are very difficult. Um, and, and so he sort of, in all of the recital programs that we, that we put together, he always threw in a Poulenc group, which I cursed him for when, I, when we were learning it, but I thanked him for when we were performing it. So I, before we go to questions and answers, I want to play this, uh, this Poulenc song also because you're so famous for Poulenc and he is one of my favorite composers. Stunning, stunning. 
that's one of those that's one of those sort of quasi cabaret styles of songs that he writes fantastic oh you, thank you are, uh, what an astounding career you have will you come to tulsa and do a recital with malcolm in our new laban soul opera house that we're building what a good idea let's talk we'll talk we'll talk yeah. and you know if 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 my my uh british pianist can get a visa to come over here and if <laughs> and if all of our restrictions are lifted yes we'll get back to it back to tulsa that's right so that's right. So we're gonna I'm, we're gonna go back to Danny uh, now. Th thank you for for now, and uh, so we get some questions and answers. Danny will explain the procedure. I wanted to let you know we have some uh, new Tulsa Opera swag here, special for Tulsa Opera Live. And if you're interested in having one of these in your collection, send me an email. I will put my email in the chat and I will get back to you about how to get your own. Uh, Ms. Graham, was there something you'd like to say as we all are paying attention to our glasses? I don't know if all of y'all have a, uh, a glass in front of you with anything in it at all. Mine happens to not have coffee. It has rosé in it but I would like to offer a toast to the Tulsa Opera and to Tobias and to Donnie and for every, all of you who have shown up tonight to enjoy our little chat. And I'm, I, I'm sure that I saw some of you the night I was in Tulsa and got to meet you. And if I didn't then, I look forward to doing it the next time. Here's to Tulsa Opera. Champagne, coffee, tea, rosé, whatever you got. Here's to all of you. And to you. Yum. Isn't that cute? Mm -hmm. So who has a question for Miss Graham or Tobias? Okay, we'll start with Bruce. Uh, Miss Graham, you've been uh, at two of the, the greatest performances I've ever seen. Uh, I was at the world premiere of Dead Man Walking in uh, San Francisco and the uh, world premiere of uh, An American Tragedy in New York. And uh, they were just extraordinary evenings. And I was supposed to be at the Great Gatsby, but was ill and a friend of mine actually got to see you. So you've been uh, just thank you for all of the, your great singing. And I just have uh, one question. This is about the great Gatsby. Are you a golfer in real life? And related to an American tragedy, has New York really changed you? Wow, two very, very good questions. Um, I, I have played golf. I would be very far from calling myself a golfer, but I had fun. I had so much fun playing that role. My favorite thing about it was doing the Charleston though, I have to admit and the amazing beaded gowns. Um, I will say that um, New York, of course New York changed me. Are you kidding? I moved to New York when I was 20, uh, the day after my 25th birthday from Texas. I moved to New York to go to Manhattan School of Music and, uh, oh my goodness. Hi, excuse me, I have a visitor. Hi, sweetie, come here. Look. Oh. Is my dirty pod puppy? Can you believe it? Mm, sorry. <laughs> I wanted her to come meet y'all. So say hi to Ruby. She's three months old and she's a handful. Look, Ruby, there's Tobias. Yeah, she's thrilled. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yes. So sorry about the distraction. Um, New York, I mean, I moved there the day after my 25th birthday to reinvent my life. And if you're ever going to reinvent your life, New York is the place to do it. And I, I, I did, I, I sort of got started in my life. And so, uh, yeah, Tobias knew that all too well and, and wrote that a beautiful New York aria, which I understand is no longer in the show. Is that right, Tobias? It was a, di a different one. A different one. 
Well, I loved singing that, that Ari about New York and everything about it that I sang was, was true and very easy to bring to life because I, I fully believe it. I live in California now. I still have an apartment in New York and, and I miss it. I do miss New York, but California has been a pretty good place to be for the past year, I will say. Thank you for that question, Bruce. Okay, we're gonna go over to Nicole. Hey, Susan. Uh, so how are you feeling about live performances starting again? I know you have um, some stuff coming up soon. Yeah, it's, uh, it's weird. I've missed it so much. I've done a lot of, you know, obviously I've done a lot of videos. I've done a lot of Zoom things. Um, and it's odd and disconcerting to be singing only for a camera. It's not nearly as much fun as, as sharing the space with breathing humans and exchanging energy. You know, I, I think if anybody ever doubted the power of the circular energy between an audience and the stage, this year has proven it 100%. Um, I, did a, I did a recording at Christmas time, a holiday recording in a cathedral in Santa Fe. And it was meant to just, you know, be for uh, Santa Fe performances and to be aired and to be streamed and all that stuff. And I asked the, pro the, the producer if I could bring two friends from Santa Fe to come and sit in the recording as socially distanced apart, you know, 10 feet apart, of course, with masks and everything. And he said, yes, you can bring them. So the, the mere fact that I had two people in there that I loved changed the experience for me completely because I could, I was getting to, was getting to share my love, you know, with real people. So that's what I'm most looking forward to, to returning. I mean, it's going to be, and also singing on recordings only is difficult because you, there's so much pressure to be perfect because you know, somebody can hit pause and rewind it and play it over and over again. If it wasn't your greatest note or whatever, singing live, it's in the, we're in the moment. And we understand that we're human. And if something isn't perfect, at least they can't listen to it 400 times. <laughs> but I, I am really looking forward to it. I have a recital in Philadelphia on May 11th that I assumed would be canceled like everything else. It's been on the books for a couple of years, but it is not canceled. They're, they've moved it to a smaller venue and there will be 25 or 30 people in attendance, but it will also be streamed. So I haven't gotten rid of the video component yet, but at least there are people in the room I can communicate with, which is really important to me. Didn't you, you just did a, a digital production of Jake's Three Decembers? Right? That's right. That's right, yeah, I did. No audience for that. Or... There, was, there was no audience. In fact, we weren't even in a theater. We weren't allowed to be in a theater. We recorded with Opera San Jose, we recorded, um, Three Decembers by Jake Heggie. There are three people in the cast and it was all under strict COVID protocols. Uh, this was back in the fall and, uh, and it was streamed for their donors and you know, for donations and things like that. And it was, it was amazing after, uh, even from last March to only October, but after that many months to be in the same room with people, whether there was an audience or not, but to do opera and to tell a story together and just to collaborate again, like, like I've done for the past 30 years of my life. But when you don't do it for 10 months and then you get a chance to get back on that horse again, it's like flying. It's like, oh, this is what we do. We get to share emotions with people. We get to st tell stories together with people. And it was, it was really a shot, a shot in the arm which I'm getting again tomorrow, my second one. <laughs> Moderna or Pfizer? Uh, Moderna. I know, I'm fingers crossed that it's, that it's gonna be okay. We have other Anybody questions? else? Other questions? questions? We have a very non-questioning audience. Come on, y'all, my life's an open book. If it's interesting at all, I lived, in Cal I lived in New York for almost 35 years and I moved to California four years ago when I got married. Because if you marry a Californian, you have to move to California because they're not going anywhere. Okay, we'll go down to um, Laura. 
Pixel 3, that's Laura, right? Yes. And then, and then um, Terry will come back to you. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me. I can. Um, oh, great. So my question is two part. Um, do you remember the, at what age were you when you um, practiced singing in front of the mirror to, uh, as well as to your hairbrush, like all the young girls do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was probably 12. Oh, you peaked at good age. <laughs> Oh, that was 1972. So, yeah, I'm sure I was rocking some Karen Carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> I, still, yeah. I still rock Karen Carpenter whenever I get a chance to, by the way. <laughs> right. Who doesn't? <laughs> it's my favorite. And here's my second part of the question. Um, of all, there's so many great opera film actresses, singers that are from the 40s and uh, on. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember times that maybe as a young child or relatives of yours that saw Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy singing together or and yeah. you watched it and then Mario Lanzo was, as well? That was my mother's generation. She was more into Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy and uh, Gordon McRae and all those people. Um, I, I grew up wanting to be Barbara Streisand. That was more my milieu. I wasn't that attracted to opera until I started doing it in college. Oh. Although I will say, I don't know if any of y'all remember when Houston Grand Opera had a touring leg called Texas Opera Theater. And they, yeah, they, they came through my hometown of Midland, Texas, my senior year of high school, and they did Cosi Fantute of Mozart. And my voice teacher took me to it. It was in our, my high school auditorium. And I sat there and I was watching this very funny Mozart story unfold. And the maid comes in and she gets to be funny, sing Mozart and drink hot chocolate. And I thought, I wanna do that for a living. <laughs> Cause I was already a pianist and I'd already been playing a lot of Mozart. And I'd probably studied a couple of Mozart songs by that point. I thought, that looks like fun. So. And it was actually many years later, I found out that it was fun. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, Terry. Oh, I, I'm in Norman, Oklahoma. I've been here for 40 years and I used to live in Charlottesville, Virginia and I'm from Western New York. And I just want to say to Ms. Graham and to Tobias, First of all, thank you for having this event this evening, especially during COVID. Um, we have gone to Tulsa Opera Productions in the past. I haven't, we, there have been family conflicts, so I haven't gone for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, every Saturday is the radio, the Metropolitan Opera radio broadcasts are on in my house or in my car, wherever I am. So I listen to you and if there are productions on PBS with you and Renee Fleming or anybody else, we're watching those. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. I just so appreciate um, your voice in particular and just what, you know, how you share this and, and through the media that are available. I've been on the board of Musical Theater Opera Guild here at the University of Oklahoma for some time and we have promising students. And, uh, oh, cool. and we've had student, public school student productions here in the past. And so- Don't come back, you'll have them again. So yes, I'm waiting for the Met, just really excited for the Met and all the other companies to be able to come back. Well, I'm really happy to hear that, that um, opera has brought you so much solace during this time, because it's, it's, it's nice to hear that because- yes. um, you know, it's been a it's been a challenging time for opera companies to uh, to provide the content right. to everybody, and I, I think that I I really applaud all the companies for their resourcefulness and and not only providing pre recorded you know operas that have been done in the past like the Met has been doing, but also um, you know current content as well and and young artist programs providing online recitals and um i'm on the 
uh, the Los Angeles Opera Young Artist Program. I'm, I'm one of the administrators of that and I teach the young artists here in Los Angeles. And, um, and I'm really proud of the work that, that our Young Artist Program has done um, in, in producing digital operas. They, you know, they get tested and they're, they've, they've done operas together that have been filmed online and, they, and they've all done several living room recitals, you know, and, and they've just been, I, I just really admire the, the energy of all the young artists across the country, because can you imagine, can you imagine being fresh out of grad school with, with talent and you're, you're invited to be part of a young artist program anywhere in the country and your star is just starting to rise and then everything shuts down for a year. No. Right, when you right when you're at the age when you should be doing four auditions a week and sending your audition materials to everybody and managers are looking for you and you know opera companies are hiring you and then it all just stops. I feel so bad for those people. And also for people who are like just 10 years into their career and they're just, they're living paycheck to paycheck. And yes. this happens, like it's, it's heartbreaking, but I, I have a lot of admiration for the ones, for everybody who has been weathering all this, but particularly for those young artists who, who have kept up their spirits and have taken the opportunity of this year to hone their craft and to refine their singing. And I, I, I don't, I, when I was their age, I might've had the energy, but at 60 years old, I've been practicing retirement <laughs> and it's been pretty fun. <laughs> yes. Well, and I know where you are because I'm originally from Long Beach many years ago. I am. But my son and his wife met in Oklahoma City and they live in the Silver Lake neighborhood of LA. So well, when, I'm in Burbank. We're practically neighbors. So when would we fly into Burbank? So when we can travel, which we haven't done for over a year now, we, we visit them and we always get tickets to the LA Phil or some other, and I'm a member of LACMA. So to, yep. to support the arts, we just mix family and the arts and everything. That's a good thing. So thank you so much for all that you've done for it. Thank arts. you, Terry. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's very kind of here. Just brings, it's brought a lot of, <laughs> it's brought a lot of pleasant diversion to my life for the last year. I'm glad to hear that. We're very glad to hear that. Do we have time for one more question? Anybody? Anybody? Anything? Yeah. Um, from another Susan. Miss Graham, I wanted to first say hi because uh, we met you when we were having breakfast with Gayletha Nichols a couple of years ago in Santa Fe. And oh we had my a very gosh, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's nice to see your face again and hear your voice. And um, as somebody who grew up out here in the heartland, so to speak, um, what, what do you think were the benefits and the drawbacks of coming from such a, from a place that's so far removed uh, from the New York City music scene? You know, what do you think different, did, the, did that differentiate you from the people who had grown up in that scene quite a bit? I think so, I think so, Susan, that's a great question. When I, when I moved to New York and I enrolled in Manhattan School of Music, which was really just a reason to be in New York because I knew I needed to be in New York, but I, uh, I figured I might as well make use of my time there by getting another degree. <laughs> So, um, and I studied, you know, I had some great, great teachers. When I first got there, I felt that my coming from, you know, Midland and Lubbock and Roswell before that <laughs> hindered me because I didn't, ha I hadn't had the exposure to mm -hmm. a lot of opera that my classmates at Manhattan, the people who had grown up in New York and going to the Met every week and their grandmother took them every week since they were seven years old. And I thought, I don't have that. And, and I'm woefully behind the curve. Later on, when I started, and e even in school a little bit, but when I, when I got out into the professional world, I realized that it was kind of a gift because I came to everything with a clean canvas. You know, I didn't have 20 years of, of you know, watching Risa Stevens or, you know, or Frederica von Stadt or Marilyn Horn or Crystal Ludwig do all my roles. I came to everything clean and that mm -hmm. allowed me to make my own choices and to let the music affect me 
how it affected me. I didn't, I, of course, I, you know, I listened to recordings like everybody, but I always had the, I had the piano skills to sit down and play through a part myself, a new score by myself, except for Tobias's because they're so difficult. I, I, it was way above my piano skill level. <laughs> <laughs> and most Strauss. Darn, I would say. darn Tobias. <laughs> But my point is, I, 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 could, I could sit down at a piano and figure out how I felt about the character or the role or the music or the score or, you know, the song or whatever it was. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, ignorance is bliss. I don't know. I was ignorant. So in some ways it was, in some ways you were more intimidated, in some ways you were less intimidated because you hadn't grown yeah, up with it, these and it giants. Changed, it changed over the years. At first I was completely daunted because I didn't have the exposure and later on I was grateful for it. Thank you. I hope we get to see you in Tulsa sometime soon. I do too. Um, Jennifer Watson had her hand up a minute ago. Hi. Hi. It's good to see you. Um, I was just going to ask, you mentioned earlier that you won, was it the Met Council Auditions with Renee? Yes. Fleming. I uh, wanted your advice on how that whole process went for you, because I'm hoping to do it in the next couple of years. Okay. Well, I had moved to New York, like I said, to go to school. And a lot of people mm -hmm. in New York don't audition in New York. They go back to their hometowns to audition because they think that, you know, the competition will be less stiff than it is in New York. And I didn't have the money or the time or the wherewithal to get on a plane and go back to, you know, audition in Lubbock or Midland or wherever the auditions were being held, probably Dallas. And, um, and so I just auditioned in New York and I thought, eh, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. So I remember going to uh, the 92nd Street Y, which is where the first round of auditions were. And, and I, I won. And I, I, I went outside to the pay phone on the corner because this was way pre-cell phones. And I called my voice teacher and I said, oh my gosh. She goes, how did it go? I said, I won. And she said, of course you did. I went, no, 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 you don't understand. I did not expect to win. Anyway, that happened sort of for the, the, the first and the second and the third rounds. And then I find myself on stage at the Met walking out on stage for my audition first time I've ever been on the stage and there's this gigantic cavern and I thought I am a pipsqueak little flea on the butt of a dog <laughs> I'm never going to be heard in this place but I just did what I did and I and I won I was one of 11 winners that year including Renee Fleming and Ben Hepner and all these amazing people and I, what I will say to you is every time you go out for an audition, whether it's for an opera company or whether it's for a competition or the Met competition or anything, make sure that you know the story that you want to tell with each piece and just tell your story. And if you don't, you know, if mean everything that you say, there is no random word. There is no random sound that comes out of you for no reason. And if you can commit in yourself and in your voice and, and in your interpretation and in your expression to every piece that you sing, you will know that you've done the best job you can. And that's really what it's about. It's not really about winning. It's about doing the best job that you can in that moment. And if you fully commit to what you're doing, then you know you've done your best. I hope that's helpful. Thanks. I really, I think so. Good. Just be, be very prepared and be very committed. I always tell my young singers, mean what you say and say what you mean in life and in singing. It's what my daddy taught me. Thanks, Jennifer, for your question and everyone else's question. Really very, it's nice to have so much engagement tonight. And thank you again, Susan, for for joining us for our... Such a pleasure. I do um, want to uh, invite all, all of you who are, can come to our uh, Greenwood Overcomes concert, which is on May 1st and May 2nd, commemorating the 
Centennial of the Tulsa Race Massacre, which is co-curated by Metropolitan Opera pianist and assistant conductor Howard Watkins. Susan, you know Howard. And uh, he'll be the pianist for the night. The, the concert's co-sponsored by the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. We are featuring works by 23 living Black composers with world premieres sung uh, by eight stars, Denise Graves, Leah Hawkins, Leona Mitchell, Zakiah Savage, Noah Stewart, Christy Swan, Kevin Thompson, and Devon Tynes. The four commissioned works on the program are the first ever commissioned works by Tulsa Opera in our 73 year history. So I hope you can make it. And uh, if you cannot make it, we're live streaming the concert on at 7.30 Central Time on May 1st on our uh, website, tulsopera.com. Thank you all for joining us tonight and for being part of the conversation and, and have a wonderful week. Thank you, everybody. Ruby says bye. Night, Susan. Mm -hmm.